Professor Steve Gervin. For those of you who don't know him, uh, just a legendary professor here at Yale uh, and uh, someone who's been a great partner to us uh, in terms of YQI and its connections uh, to the Schmidt program at Jackson. He's Yale's Eugene Higgins Professor of Physics and Applied Physics. He's previously served as Deputy Provost of the University for Science and Technology, Deputy Provost for Research, um, and his scholarship has focused on theoretical studies of quantum many particle systems, uh, interests in atomic physics, quantum optics, quantum computation. Uh, and in addition to teaching at Yale, he has served as the founding director of uh, Brookhaven National Laboratories co-design center for quantum advantage, where he remains an active member. And this is a major national effort uh, funded by the Department of Energy to accelerate transformational advances in quantum science and to build the tools necessary to create scalable quantum computer systems. So in terms of what that means for global affairs and uh, very delighted to hand it over to Steve uh, to introduce other colleagues. I know we have some folks here from uh, Professor Shruti Puri's class as well. So welcome to all of you. And I think this will be a fun session. So appreciate Great. it, Steve. Thanks Thank you. Thanks very much. Uh, this is, uh, I hope this will be fun. Uh, so I have some help. Uh, Trada Singh uh, is a graduate student uh, with me and Shruti Puri. Uh, Kevin Smith and Jan Price are postdocs. And we have some, uh, some physicists uh, here from Shruti's class. And um, so the first thing is uh, the, you know, the most important sentence you can learn uh, as a scientist and to succeed is I don't understand. So, you know, we talk this stuff every day. We have like kind of inside baseball lingo. If I accidentally use some uh, or quantum mechanics is just too strange for you. Stick your hand up and say, I don't understand. And we have time and I want to, you know, I'd rather uh, uncover a little than cover a lot. Uh, and so I also promise uh, we won't talk about uh, this stuff. <laughs> and uh, please, you know, just don't be shy and uh, please interrupt. So, um, so I thought I'd the way this is going to work is, um, or we hope it's going to work, is I'll, I'll give a, I have a slide deck, and the first part is just kind of you know what's quantum about and what's going on these days, and then we're going to talk about a specific protocol for encrypting communications in a way that can't be broken without violating the laws of physics. So it's a physical based uh, encryption. And we're gonna, you have some handouts, we're gonna do some little exercises. So I'll, I'll say some stuff that will sound complicated and you'll get a chance to practice it. It'll seem easy, then we'll move on. I hope that's the plan. <laughs> okay. So, um, so there's, you know, there's a, a sort of second quantum revolution going on right now. And I want to just give you a little uh, background about that. So first, I, I have a few places where I say vocabulary just to make sure I'm using uh, words in, in uh, a way that you understand. And um, so when we say classical mechanics, uh, uh, we mean the things that Galileo and Newton did in the late 1600s. And uh, it, it's an extremely successful theory of mechanical motion, of the moon, of falling apples, uh, footballs, planets. Uh, and when I say quantum mechanics or the quantum theory, that's a more complete theory invented in the 20th century that explains all of this, but this fails for very small objects. And quantum theory applies to tiny objects like atoms and electrons and individual particles of light, photons. Okay. And so quantum theory is uh, the single most successful uh, theory in, in all of the physical sciences. A theory is, you know, if you have uh, 
evolution debates, you know, theory is actually the highest uh, adjective, not the lowest. Uh, it means that it's been fully uh, confirmed by experiment with many, many digits of accuracy. So quantum theory describes behavior at atomic scales and now uh, larger scales, even millimeter scales um, in some of the qubits, the quantum bits that we build. And it's extremely strange and mysterious and counterintuitive uh, picture of the world in which you have to use language like particles act like waves and waves act like particles. Uh, and they're very counterintuitive effects uh, that the, you can prepare exactly the same experiment over and over again and get different random results each time, even though it's exactly the same. There's a certain built-in ineluctable randomness in the results. And then there's this thing that Einstein hated, spooky action at a distance entanglement, uh, which for which the um, uh, was discovered a long time ago, but for which really solid experiments have only been done uh, in the last 40 years and are the subject of uh, this year's Nobel Prize in Physics. So Einstein, uh, you know, invented a lot of the ideas of quantum mechanics, but he hated it. And he couldn't deal, he just couldn't stand the fact that there should be non-deterministic results. There should be you know, ineluctable randomness. And he said, uh, God does not play dice. But modern physicists um, like to say that the irony is that it was Einstein who gave God the, the dice. He, he really uh, gave us a lot of the ideas that found, uh, founded the quantum theory. So the first quantum revolution, the, the sort of invention of the quantum theory, uh, beginning more than 100 years ago, people were, physicists were just thinking about um, very basic things about reality and electrons and atoms and uh, light. And there were, it's just curiosity driven fundamental research. I wanna put a plug in that for you future policy leaders. Um, there were no conceivable applications for these kind of uh, things, uh, thinking about things that were invisible, tiny atoms and so forth. And, and yet it led to the technological revolution of the 20th century. It led to the transistor, the laser, the atomic clock, which in turn led to the global positioning system. And the inventors of quantum mechanics did not foresee these quantum devices. And even the more practical engineers who invented these quantum devices <clears throat> did not foresee their applications, which are, you know, all around you and yet invisible, right? So, uh, you know, here's a picture of Charlie Towns in 1953 with this big clunky uh, physics experiment that was one of the first atomic clocks. Uh, that it's hard to imagine that today, you know, I hold in my hand a gadget that knows by listening to transmissions from satellites where it is on the, what time it is to about a nanosecond and where it is on the earth to a few meters of precision. It's just incredible. Uh, there's the first transistor, 1947. It's about this big. You can see beautiful uh, blobs of solder and wires and <laughs> yeah, it's incredibly ugly. Uh, and uh, those uh, 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 people who invented that could not foresee this. And the, you know, the central processing unit in your, uh, in your computer. And they certainly could not foresee the number of transistors being produced in the world today. Any idea how many transistors are made? in one second every day of every year. More than 20 trillion transistors per second. It's a good thing they're small. <laughs> Otherwise we'd run out of stuff. So you know the scaling from one at a centimeter scale to 20 uh, 
you know, I, there's about roughly 20 billion in, in, in an iPhone, uh, depending on how you count even more. Um, it's just amazing and very hard to foresee. So we hope that this same thing is going to happen with the second quantum revolution, but we have a long, long way to go. So we've recently come to understand that these quantum devices aren't very quantum. They don't have the full power that's available to quantum machines. And in particular, there's much more power for processing and communicating information than we realized. And so the new idea, which is driving this second quantum revolution is that the very strangest aspects of quantum theory, this uncertainty and randomness, which I'll, I'll, sh I'll show you some examples. Uh, they're not bugs like it seems like to a classical physicist, oh, you do an experiment exactly the same way every time and you get a random result, that seems bad. I can't predict as well as I could before. You can predict the probabilities of different results, but you can't predict the results of any experiment. It seems like a bug, but in fact, it can be a feature that we can use in technologies. And in fact, that randomness is going to be key to our quantum encryption protocol that we're going to work through today for tr securely transmitting information. So um, this is, a, I think, the final slide on this. So there's this revolution underway. I tried to explain we couldn't predict the consequences of the first one. So uh, I don't think we can predict the consequences of this one. It has the potential to fizzle out because the technology is just too difficult at this point, or it has the potential to, you know, perhaps be as revolutionary as the as the tech revolution of the 20th century. And it involves sort of three things: uh, quantum materials with novel properties, quantum sensing. We under measurement is a very important part of quantum mechanics. The role of an observer is special. When you observe something, you change it. That's going to be part of our encryption protocol also. And we've learned much more about how to the ultimate limits of making precision measurements. And those are being used both for fundamental physics, uh, things like seeing black hole mergers producing tiny vibrations of space time, which uh, we can now measure. Uh, and it's also, the start, you know, can be used in intelligence gathering. Um, you can use a thing which is kind of like an atomic clock to uh, fly over a mountain and see whether there's a tunnel inside because there's less gravity than you expect because there's a, a tunnel there. Uh, and then uh, information processing is uh, very important. And what's a lot of what's done in this institute is centered around quantum building computers based on the principles of quantum mechanics. But our discussion today is going to be about communication, uh, security, and encryption. OK, so uh, the technology is not here yet. We're in the very earliest uh, days. I wouldn't say we're in the earliest part of the hype, hype cycle, but we're <laughs> Uh, we're probably headed for some uh, troughs of dis disillusionment before we uh, finally get this technology to work. But lots and lots of money is being invested uh, in these technologies uh, now because of their great potential. Okay, so uh, I'm going to pause here, we're going to start our discussion of the main topic for today, uh, secure communication. But maybe if you have questions now about what I've said so far, I'm happy to take them. Yeah. Um, so you were describing in the first quantum revolution that it was first fundamental research with that was curiosity driven and then applications have followed. So yeah. in the second revolution, is it following like kind of a similar? Ab absolutely. Yeah, I mean, the, um, you know, the, the people that started thinking about these questions roughly 30 years ago were 
uh, theorists completely disconnected to expand the realities of experiment and uh, uh, slowly they started getting some interesting ideas. Other people started paying attention and then people started thinking about, well, maybe there's a way to actually make these ideas work in practice. And there's just huge effort going on now um, uh, making the technology better and better, but still we've made huge progress, but we have a tremendous way to go before it becomes, let's say, economically or uh, 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 important, but we're, we're on that same route. Yeah. Good. Yeah. Um, introduce yourself. Okay. Yeah. Michelle Pelema, uh, Jackson MAS student for the one year program in the army. Uh, and for the, concept of flying over a mountain and being able to detect the different level of gravity you said. Is yep. there a phrase that I can use to research that in the future? Uh, you can probably try gravitational anomaly. I, I can send you the name of a person if that doesn't work. <laughs> yeah. Hi, Josh. Second year. Hi. Um, can you explain like how transistors connect to quantum? Because my understanding is that transistors are like binary. And that's kind of like different. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So, um, so uh, transistors can encode classical. I'm going to talk about this classical bits. There are switches that can be on or off, or have a voltage or not have a voltage. And uh, that's that's how classical bits are manipulated in your computer. I'm going to talk about how quantum bits are different. Yeah. Okay. All right. So, um, so some more vocabulary. So, the uh, when you write a paper in communication and encryption, you 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 always use that Alice is sending a message to Bob. These are the uh, <laughs> these are the terms of art in the field. And there's an eavesdropper named Eve. Okay. So the problem is Alice has a secret message she wants to send to Bob over some communication channel, radio, optical fiber, telephone, whatever. Uh, and she wants to uh, make sure that Bob is the only person in the world that gets the message and knows, knows what it says. And the eavesdropper may have access, you know, may, uh, to pick an example, uh, from the 19... 60s. There may have been a uh, submarine that went into the Bering Sea and may have dropped a Bell Labs uh, magnetometer down around a little undersea cable and may have picked up uh, all the signals from the magnetic fields emanating from the currents in those wires. My uncle may have been on that boat. Uh, <laughs> so there are ways to intercept uh, the signals and see what they are. So you have to, you don't want to send them in plain text. You want to encode them in some secret code. So, um, so, but before we like start talking about that, we have to kind of define what, you know, and quantify what is information. Okay. Well, information is surprise. Uh, if I tell you um, the sun rose this morning, it's not much of a surprise, right? The information is I tell you something you didn't know before, okay? And if I tell you the answer to a yes, no question that you didn't know before and kind of prior to this, you, you had no idea, you know, you had just estimated it's a 50-50 probability I'm going to hear yes or no. That's receiving one bit of information, uh, binary digit, and it can be represented by a true or false or yes or no, or in a computer by a zero or a one. Okay, so you can, uh, 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 another example is, and uh, we have some coins here today we're going to be using, we want them all back. Uh, yeah, I'm so, so, bad. <laughs> <laughs> so Alice flips a coin. She, nobody knows whether it's going to land heads or tails, and she reveals which it was. That's one bit of information. 
not necessarily a useful one, but it's a bit of information. If she tells Bob, it gets one bit. So a bit string is just a, a collection of uh, ones and zeros. And in this case, uh, it, it, it's a byte. It contains eight bits of information. OK, so what can you do with these bit strings? Well, you could, if you sent strings of five bits, you could encode the alphabet in, let's say, in English. So A could be all zeros, B could be four zeros and a one, C could be zero, 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 one, zero. Uh, those of you that might know about binary numbers, those are the binary numbers representing zero, one, two, three, four, five. You need uh, uh, five bits to represent uh, 32 characters. So you've got the 26 letters and you can do a few numbers also. Or you could, you could have a, a, a code book. There used to be, you know, literally books on Navy ships uh, with uh, different messages. So here are some very famous messages from history, telegrams. Uh, and then you could represent this message by this bit string, zero, 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 zero. So probably nobody here knows where that comes from. The Italian navigator has landed in the New World. The natives are friendly. It's not Columbus. It's Enrico Fermi in Chicago. Got the first uh, nuclear pile operating in the Manhattan Project. This is the telegram that was sent to Washington. So itself is encoded, right? It's in English, but <laughs> uh, it's just, it, it, this was prearranged to mean that the uh, atomic uh, uh, I'll work. Probably you know what this is. It's 50 years ago, okay, landing on the moon. Uh, and this is probably easy to guess, but maybe uh, Orville Wright sending a telegram to his father in Ohio saying they were coming home for Christmas and uh, the airplane worked. <laughs> okay, so uh, if you had such a big code book, if it had 1,024 messages, you only need 10 bits to encode them all, because 10 digits can represent all the numbers between 0 and 1,023. If you had 20 bits, you can send a million different messages. It's very, very efficient. Okay, And as long as only Alice and Bob have copies of the code book, you're fine. But of course, uh, if people start correlating the messages with what they see, you know, if there's a message that's attack it every time they send bit strings, you know, one, 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 and there's a, an attack at the following dawn, you can kind of start to guess what's going on. So it's a, it's a very complicated cat and mouse game of offense and defense in uh, signals. Okay, so here's the, the transistor. Uh, rather than a transistor, I have just a, some mechanical uh, switch. And you can store one bit of information in the position of the switch. If the switch is off, so the light bulb is not shining, uh, we'll call that zero. If the switch is closed, so that circuit, the current can flow from the battery through the light bulb, we'll call that a one. And you can transmit that bit to other people <laughs> in the form of, of uh, the light coming from the light bulb. So information is physical, we like to say. It's always transmitted, uh, stored in and transmitted by physical systems. So these, instead of these mechanical switches, you have electrical switches that are controlled by, by electricity in the form of transistors in your computers. Okay, so, uh, there's one provable, provably secure method in classical communication, meaning with ordinary uh, bits, uh, to, to do secure information transition, transmission. And that's the one-time one pad encryption using a random key. So Alice and Bob have a pad of paper, and it had they flipped coins or something. And they have um, written down a completely random string of bits, zeros and ones. They've also encoded their English language plain text message 
as a string of zeros and ones. That's called the plain text. Right? And then that text is encrypted by the following rule. Uh, uh, if, if the key is zero, take the plain text and just copy it down here. If the key is one, copy the opposite of what is here. If it's a one, you put a zero. If it's a zero, you put a one, okay? So it's as if uh, there are two ways to, let, let's think of these as, I don't know, yes and no. There are two ways to encode yes and no. Zero is yes, no is one, or the other way around. And for each bit, Alice is flipping a coin to decide which code to use. So once you've done that, this, this string is completely random. There is no way that you can, even if you intercept it, no way to know what it means unless you have this key. So if Bob has, if Alice has this key and Bob has a copy of it, Bob can go in the other direction and decrypt very easily. He looks at the key and applies the same rule. If it's a zero, just copy it back up here. If it's a one, copy the opposite. So the two rules just can't, applying it twice just cancels the effect of the encryption. Does that make sense? So okay. it's provably, you know, the weak link in all of this is always the people, but mathematically, if the people are behaving themselves, mathematically, you can prove this is perfectly secure. As long as the key is completely random, there's no pattern to the zeros and ones, it has to be as long as the message because you have to encrypt each single bit and you can never reuse it because there'll be correlations between subsequent messages if you do. And so that's why it's called a one-time path. Okay? So that's, that's basic classical encryption. This is provably secure, but it has a huge problem, the key distribution problem. The secret key, uh, if Bob doesn't have it, Alice has to send it to Bob, and it's a, it's a bit string that's the same length as the message. If she can't send the message securely, how could she send the secret key securely? So maybe Bob, uh, uh, you know, went back to, uh, somewhere in Virginia and, and copy down what she had on the, uh, Alice had on her one time pad and kept it with him, hopefully for safekeeping and nobody saw it, then it'll work. But uh, if, if Alice and Bob are in different corners of the globe and haven't been able to do that, you're stuck because you can't distribute the secret key. It's the same problem as secretly distributing the message. Does that make sense? Okay, so Eve, Eve could intercept the telephone call, the, the, uh, the internet transmission, the optical fiber transmission, uh, and, and see what either the message or the secret key are, and then just send it on or observe it as it goes by or send it on to Bob. And Bob is none the wiser that the eavesdropper is there and has compromised the channel. So it turns out there's a solution to the key distribution problem if you use a quantum version of bits, okay? And this is a protocol that was invented uh, by my friend Charlie Bennett and uh, colleague Gilles Brazard in 1984. It was based on an older idea called quantum money by, invented by Steve Wiesner, who was the son of the Wiesner, who was the MIT president. Um, didn't, didn't, uh, couldn't get it published <laughs> until much later after these, these guys had done their protocol. Okay, so we're gonna go through this there's lots to unpack here. You got to find out what is a quantum bit, et cetera, et cetera. But here's, here's I just want to do the big picture. Um, so uh, here's Alice in the Quantum Institute, and this is Bob. Bob is up the street in the Jackson School. Eve is somewhere in between. And there are two ways we can communicate. There is a public channel, meaning um, it's a telephone or 
internet connection, something that's potentially whose security is not guaranteed, okay? And then there's a, a quantum channel, which I'm gonna have to explain to you what it is. Uh, and Eve, Eve has access potentially to both channels and both channels are gonna be part of the protocol. So there's a part that uh, you don't need uh, quantum things to send. You can just talk over the telephone um, and anybody can listen in and it can still be secure. And that's an interesting aspect of it because it has this quantum channel, okay? And we're gonna try to be consistent in our color coding. So green will mean uh, public channel, uh, anybody, it means classical and anybody could in principle be listening in. And then the red will mean quantum channel and blue will mean classical or, or not quantum. Okay, so here's the, here's the basic idea I want you to hold on to as we <laughs> march through the complicated parts. Uh, in quantum mechanics, if you observe, that is measure the state of a quantum system, it changes. And uh, it's, it's the act of looking at something like shining light on it and bouncing it to your eye, but something is so tiny and fragile that shining a little light on it changes it. That's roughly the idea. And this BB84 protocol, it's uh, set up to detect the presence of the eavesdropper who is observing what's being sent on the quantum channel. There are gonna be quantum bits, which I have to explain to you, that are sent along here. And if Eve looks at them, makes a measurement of them to see uh, what secret key is being sent to Bob, uh, they will uh, unwittingly modify the state of those bits and corrupt what the information that's being sent to Bob. But there is part of the protocol is that Bob and Alice will be able to detect that that happened. Okay, and then call it off if there's somebody there. Okay, so again, information is still physical, even if it's quantum information. Instead of storing information in a, you know, a big written zero or one on a piece of paper or a switch being open or closed, we're gonna store information in maybe the space of a single atom or a single particle of light, a photon. And quantum mechanics teaches us that the energy levels of an atom are discrete. They're quantized. They're not, they don't vary continuously. And you can label them then with integers and the lowest two you can call states zero and one. So if the energy is the lowest possible, maybe that represents bit value zero. And the first excited state represents bit value one. And there are many physical systems that can hold this. Atoms, molecules, ions, photons. Here at Yale, we work a lot with uh, electrical circuits, superconducting electrical circuits. Even small mechanical oscillators can have quantized energy levels. Okay, well, quantum bits are very, very, very strange and mysterious. So we have to, you know, fasten your seat belts and we have to think about these very non-intuitive things. So in addition to having the possibility of being in state zero or state one, there's an infinite a number, a continuous range of states called uh, superposition states which are in some sense intermediate between zero and one. And yet if you measure which uh, state it's in, it always comes out to be zero or one. So for the purposes of this protocol, we're gonna use only four states and we're gonna, they're called polarization states and we're gonna represent them by arrows. So that the qubit, the atom or whatever is holding the qubit, the arrow can point up or down or to the right or to the left. Those are the only four states that we're gonna talk about. Uh, if you look online at videos about this protocol, they usually talk about uh, photon polarizations and they use these uh, lines with arrows on both ends uh, and sloped uh, 
uh, like this, those four symbols, but it just doesn't matter. There's four, four symbols, okay? And uh, there's, there's one bit of information in here, a zero or one, and yet there are four states. And it's because they represent two different ways to put the zero and one in there. Just like in the one-time pad, you could start with a, a zero in the plain text and represent it either as a zero or one in the encrypted text, randomly switching between the encodings. There are two kinds of encoding, just like the, the secret key in the one-time pad can be a zero or one. Those are two different encodings. We're going to talk about a Z basis encoding or an X basis encoding. And so uh, if Alice wants to send a zero to Bob, she can choose the Z encoding and send him an up arrow. Or she could choose the X encoding and send him a, an arrow pointing to the right. If she wants to send a one and she randomly chooses this encoding, she sends a down arrow. If she randomly chooses the X encoding, she sends a left arrow. Okay. So the blue things are the classical bits values she wants to send to Bob, and the red things are the quantum states of our bits. All right, so I think we have an exercise now. The conversion table is at the top, and the exercise on the left is you want to take the classical bit and encode it in the Z encoding into one of those four arrows, or the a zero and put it in the X encoding with one of those four arrows. And on the right, you want to do the reverse process. Here are the arrows, and you want to put zeros and ones here. Make sense? So take your time. Feel free to ask questions. We have uh, experts in the audience who are standing by to assist you. <laughs> uh, I think the next slide is the answer. Okay, so you can check your answers there. It's okay to be wrong and ask questions about why you're wrong. That's allowed. That's the other important sentence for every scientist I tell my students. When first thing, when you get out of bed in the morning, say to yourself, could I be wrong? The easiest person to fool is yourself for doing uh, science. So in the one-time pad, Alice uh, had flipped a bunch of coins and had the, the secret key and used those to randomly change the encoding for in each bit. Here, Alice is going to do something different. She's going to randomly switch between the Z encoding, where the bits are up and down, and the X encoding, where they are left and right, the, the polarizations. Okay. Now you say, well, well, that's not going to help because Bob can just look at the arrow and see whether it's up, down, right, or left. Well, it doesn't work that way. The rules of quantum mechanics don't let you know uh, both of those things. The rules of mechanic, quantum mechanics say when Bob gets a qubit and wants to see what its value is, he has to make a decision. He has to choose to see what the value is in the Z polarization to make what we call a Z measurement or X, but he can't do both. Oh, if you know where a particle is, you can't know how fast it's going or vice versa. This is like that. If you know what the value of the bit is when you measure it in, make a Z, I'm going to show you a picture of a Z measurement. When you ask, what is the value of the qubit in the Z basis? You remove the possibility that you can find out what it is in the X basis. So it's like position and momentum. Yeah. In, uh, there's a Heisenberg on circuit principle connecting them. Yeah. Is, and is the choice for each and every bit, or is it for each and every bit? We're going to, okay. Bob has to measure and he has to make a choice because he, uh, and I, you'll see, um, uh, you know, I'm going to go through it. So keep asking questions. But the, the, the first, the thing you have to know right now is he has a choice. He can either measure in the Z basis or the X basis. Now we're going to see what, what does that imply? What happens when he does that? Okay, so here's 
Uh, Bob has uh, some setting on his measurement apparatus. So you can set it to Z or X. Okay, so he sets it to Z and it happens that Alice has sent him a bunch of bits in the Z basis. So you see the arrows are up and down. Okay, what happens? Well, they just go through and uh, they're presented to Bob uh, with, um, uh, you know, this, this represents a, a zero, and there's another zero, and there's a one, okay? So the, when Bob looks at the state, it doesn't get messed up or changed, and Bob correctly learns the bit value that Alice sent, okay? Something strange happens if he chooses the wrong encoding. If he decides to make an X measurement when the, the polarization is in the Z direction, he gets random results. Sometimes it's pointing to the right, sometimes it's pointing to the left. And so, but he doesn't know that he's randomly changed the state. This would have been the result uh, if, if this polarization had been to the right and passed through the measurement, then he got this unchanged. He doesn't know that he changed it. There's no way to tell. So the bottom line is he's unsure what Alice sent. Okay. It's unpredictable. And yeah, you know, so there's this strange thing in quantum mechanics. <clears throat> the results are random. But it's not like, you know, I have an envelope, I uh, try to flip the coin, put a zero or one in a piece of paper in the envelope and handed it to me. And there's definitely either a zero or one in the envelope. And when I open it, I see what it is. That is when you open it, you see what you get. In quantum mechanics, you get what you see. You, it doesn't have a value, neither zero or one. But when you look, the act of looking brings a value into existence, zero or one. And if you ask, is it pointing in the X direction? Is it pointing horizontally? It always is. Sometimes to the right, sometimes to the left. If you ask, uh, is it pointing up or down? It always is when you measure. All right, so it works the other way too. Uh, if uh, if you, Bob chooses to make an X measurement and he happens to receive bits that are pointing left and right, it works fine. Okay, he correctly learns the classical value of the bit that Alice sent. But if he makes a Z measurement on qubits that were encoded in the X basis, he accidentally and unknowingly randomly changes them. Okay. All right, so how can we use these facts about nature, which I just have to ask you to accept at face value because they're completely insane. Um, Alice is going to, how can we use it? So Alice is going to randomly switch. He flips a coin and decides whether to uh, use the Z basis or the X basis. And she does not tell Bob in advance what, she, what she's going to do. Okay, So there's no need for, you know, communication of that, that would be the same as the key, right? So, um, so Bob doesn't know if Alice chose to encode in the Z basis or the X basis. So he doesn't know which basis to use in order to measure to get the right answer. So he just guesses, okay? He could guess Z every time or X every time, or he could flip a coin. And about half the time he'll, by chance, uh, guess correctly and half the time incorrectly. Okay. And so if he guesses correctly, he gets the correct bit value. If he guesses incorrectly, he gets a random bit value. Okay. So there's, there's a, even though it's random, it might actually be the right one. It might, it, you know, it was supposed to be zero. Maybe it comes out zero. So there's a 50% but he guesses incorrectly only 50% of the time. So that's where the 25% is. Okay, we need two, uh, two volunteers. Uh, who wants to be YouTube famous? You'll be recorded and plus it. So <laughs> if you don't want your image to be there. Uh, so you're Alice, you're Bob. You need to uh, 
compose a secret key. Okay, so we're going to flip the coin. If it's heads, write zero. If it's tails, write one. Thing. Uh, shall I flip it? Or you can do it. I don't care. Okay. So heads is zero, I think I said. Okay. No? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So, by the way, some of you are going to be. <laughs> See, I told you it was the people. One more? Or is that it? Okay, I can't count either. Okay, so now you have the secret key. Now you need to, uh, let's see, you have to do the encoding using the table over there, okay? Okay, measure from Michelle will secretly check if you did it right. Uh, good. 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 All right. Congratulations. Okay. All right. Oh yeah. Okay. So I'm I'm the That's person that uh, makes the measurement happen, and uh, it came out um, pointing to the right. Yeah. Zero. What, uh, well, yeah, you can decode it to ones and zeros at the same time if you want. Yes. Okay. And then uh, what did you choose for the second one? X again. Uh, okay, that was a mistake. Uh, tails, uh, uh, that's a one. Oh, that's an up. <laughs> so it's, a, it's, a left. it's an X, it should be right or left. Left. A one. Oh, yeah, okay. Okay, sorry. Yeah, it's an X. We should be doing this so you guys can see it. All right, what'd you pick for the third one? X again. X again, okay. Right, so it turns out it's the same, same, so you're okay. So it's pointing to the left. You got that one. Left is a you don't know that you got it right. I'm just <laughs> <laughs> okay. What's the last one? Z. Z. Okay. Uh, it's up. Okay. All right. What what did you get for the message? Zero one one zero. Okay. So uh, you you got that one wrong. Yeah, okay. uh, you got no way of going. And, and actually, how many? Let's see. So, um, this you chose the wrong basis here and the wrong basis there, but you accidentally got the bit right. Okay. Here you chose the wrong basis and got the bit wrong. Here you chose the correct basis and got it right. Okay. So, it's not guaranteed, could have gotten lucky and gotten it exactly right or gotten them all wrong. So, so here's what happened just now. Alice sent Bob, in this case we only did four, but he, let's say here's a whole long string of quantum bits. She, here's the classical bits she wants to send. Here's the encoding basis that she randomly chose for each one, okay? And so classical bit in the Z basis, that's an up arrow. Classical bit of zero in the X basis, that's a right arrow. Classical bit in one in the Z basis, that's a down arrow, et cetera, okay? So these are the quantum bits that Alice is sending to Bob. Bob randomly chooses what basis to measure in and gets about half of them right. The first three are right, the ones in red are wrong. Does that make sense, okay? So then uh, when Bob makes a measurement, this one's correct. So he correctly gets that the polarization is up. Here he correctly gets that it's to the right, here down. Here he chose the wrong basis, but accidentally got the, um, uh, oh wait, I haven't, uh, oh, okay. I just, uh, this is just a copy of what was sent. So sorry, I shouldn't have quite said that. So he, the ones that uh, he got about half of them wrong. Well, he has to figure out which half he got wrong, okay? So this is the interesting part. Alice publicly announces the basis that he used for each one. 
through this public channel. Tell everybody, even Eve. She says, I used Z, X, Z, X, Z, Z, X, X, Z, X. Okay. But she doesn't say which bit she was encoding. That is, she says it's Z, but she doesn't say whether it was up or down arrow. She says it's X, but she doesn't say whether it's left arrow or right arrow. Okay. Now, Bob, as soon as he hears the public announcement of her basis choices, he knows which measurements he did that were wrong. Like here, she said this was an X and he accidentally used a Z. So he just drops that, he discards that. He discards all the ones that are wrong, okay? And it's okay that Eve knows this. Okay. Is that clear? All right, then Bob is now going to check if there's an eavesdropper, okay? He wants to, Bob, uh, Alice publicly announces among, so Bob says, um, tells Alice which ones he's thrown away and which ones he happened to use the right measurement. And then Alice picks a small subset of those that he got right. So let's say this one, that one, and she publicly announces the actual uh, uh, bit value that she sent or the qubit polarization, okay? And Bob checks if he got the same thing. If he got the same thing, then it's probably true that there's no eavesdropper because everything matched up. If there's an eavesdropper, she would have corrupted it randomly because she also has to guess whether to measure in X or Z, okay? It's not guaranteed. But if, if this is a string of 100,000 bits and Alice uses up 30 of them for Bob to compare, the chances of getting uh, failing to detect the eavesdropper in 30 tries is very, very small. Wait, I, think, I don't know if I fully grasp why that is. Like, how, why is it that if Alice checks the the qubit with Bob that that would enable them to know if there's- Well, I'll, 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 I'm gonna explain that separately. I'm just kind of giving you the what, why he's doing it. Okay, I'll answer that in a second. Okay. So, uh, okay, so now uh, they've, they've publicly announced these bit values, so they can't use those. Uh, but all the remaining ones, like here, Bob used the, made the correct measurement, has correctly gotten the zero that she sent, but nobody else except Alice and Bob know that because there's no eavesdropper. They've eliminated that possibility. So the first entry in the secret key is one. And then here, it's a, a sorry, a zero. Then it's one. Here's a zero and here's a one. So you, you send many quantum bits and you get a little less than half of them as your secret key. And then you use it just like a one-time pad. You, you, this is just the secret key in, in the one-time pad where uh, Alice can now send on the public uh, channel her encrypted message and Bob has the secret key to decrypt it. And it can be sent publicly and Eve can hear it, but she doesn't know what to do. All right, so, uh, so we're, gonna, we're gonna do this exercise now with assuming there's no eavesdropper. And uh, uh, you're gonna break up into teams of four. In the, in the sheets, you will choose, uh, oh, I might go on that side so they can actually see me. Uh, in the first key, you will choose a random string of zero and one, either picking a point or just writing them. Then you will choose your encoding basis of X or Z, and then you will do the conversion of polarization. And then same thing, you will have- Using this table. Yes. Uh, and then you will have a Michel measurements who will come in and compare if it's the same base that Bob picks, you would get the, the same uh, direction. And if it's a different one, we'll flip a coin and write the wrong one. And then you will convert that 
and hopefully you will have the code. You can compare how much is that. Okay, so just to review what we just did, Alice, Alice picks a, a, a classical bit string randomly, a encoding basis randomly, figures out what qubits to send from that, then uh, announces publicly just the basis choice, not the arrow directions or the bit values. Bob eliminates the ones where he measured incorrectly. Then among the remaining ones where Bob is sure uh, he should agree with Alice because he measured in the same basis, they publicly compare a few. And since there was no eavesdropper in this uh, example, they should agree on those few and say, oh, there's no eavesdropper. And then get rid of those. And the remaining ones, in this case, one, these um, one, zero, one, and zero are the secret key. Okay. If Bob's <laughs> measurement, um, uh, he, he chose the right basis to measure. So he should have gotten the same thing that Alice sent. But if they're different, then they've detected the presence. They've either made a mistake, which does happen, or they've detected the presence of an eavesdropper and they halt the protocol, okay? The key isn't used to send the cryptogram and the, the secret is safe, although Bob doesn't know what it is. They have to try again later. Now, why does the eavesdropper perturb the quantum channel, change the state that Bob is receiving? Well, because just like Bob, she doesn't know which basis in which to measure to find out what Alice sent. So she guesses randomly. And uh, when she guesses X and Alice is sending uh, in the Z basis, she changes the results, OK? Just like the problem that Bob had. But uh, so when she passes it on to Bob in order to hide her presence, she has changed the results. But this protocol lets Bob and Alice compare notes publicly and see if F each uh, perturbed. So it's a very clever protocol that involves, it's secure even though it involves public communication. All right, so we're gonna try it again. And some of the groups are going to have an eavesdropper, and some of the groups are not. And we know which is which, we're going to tell you. And then you guys are going to go through the exercise and tell us whether you think there's an eavesdropper or OK? So it's the same, um, the same exercise, but if uh, Bob and Alice don't agree on the ones that they select, you have to assume there's an eavesdropper. You could get unlucky and not find out there's an eavesdropper. Uh, the, um, the probability, the failure probability, if uh, Bob and Alice sacrifice n of the bits to see if they got the same result, the probability of failure is three fourths to the n. When if n is uh, 30, that's one chance in 10,000 that you would miss the, the eavesdropper. If it's n is 50, it's pretty small. So assuming you can send hundreds of qubits, it's not a problem. Okay. It's not guaranteed, but it's exponentially unlikely that you miss the eavesdropper. You, you're by a group of four. So the cast would be Alice, Bob, Eve, and Michelle. So you all have a mission. Alice and Bob needs to make an effort to not hear what Michelle and uh, Eve are doing in the middle. So we'll try to stay in a corner and like, try not to look too much at what they're doing. Um, each paper are numbered. So you will have group one and group two. And so what we're gonna do is all the Alice's will be lined up here. All the Bob will be lining up here. Hopefully try to like aim and recognize who's your Bob. And then Alice and Eve can, uh, sorry, uh, Michelle and Eve will be in the middle during the actual transaction. Um, I have a list of who's spying on who. Um, so I'll tell you that based on your group number. Um, we were talking about uh, a little bit earlier about how some keypad gets lost. Um, 
I have the solution here. I've lost it in the room for five minutes. It, I, we didn't know where it was for a bit. <laughs> so like, no matter how much encryption you do, stupid error, human error, will be also the downfall of all this encryption because we've lost the pads uh, for a bit. So you could have find it and, and spy on us. Um, <laughs> uh, and then the last thing um, we have is a sheet of questions. Um, so basically, um, it, we're asking three questions. The first one is how many of both phases match Alice's? So we want to see like if you had five, six, three. Uh, how many bits did you, did you reveal publicly? So this is where you can gamble. You can either pick just one, two, three, as many as you want. And then you have to figure out if you uh, if you detect the eavesdropper. So at the end, we want to know if you've been spy on and how many bits you can have. Right. So and then the more, the more bit values you publicly reveal so that Bob can check if he got the right answer, the uh, more likely you are to detect the eavesdropper. Three, three fourths to the end. Yeah. But the fewer bits you have left for your secret key. So that's the trade off. If you're okay. feeling lucky, you can just stop. <laughs> Correct. Yeah. Right. So then, what, which digits are you? Okay. Um, before I have secret, secret. Right. 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 Right uh, so what happened is that you probably had between four and six bits that are correct in the string, and then you had to choose between one, two, three, a couple of bits that you can compare. Um, so I'm gonna call. We're gonna call by order the uh, the group and figure out who was fine on or not. So I'm gonna call. Where's group one? Yeah. So let's have. Um, let's have. Uh, Bob, Bob is usually the one who will call if they spy on because Alice knows what uh, what they sent. Okay, group one. Uh, who's Bob one? Were you spying on or not? What I guess or what? I yeah, what do you think? I guess no. No, not spied on. Well, you were. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> so that's the risk, and that's why we have the probability of this. Okay, who's uh, Bob two? Were you spying on or not? I don't think so. No, you were not. Correct. Oh, nice. <laughs> uh, group three, Bob three. Okay, were you spot on or not? We were. We were spot on. Yes, you were. Uh, and, and that was an interesting case here because uh, they, they compared the first bits and it was the same. And they was like, oh, we're not spot on. And if they had stuck here, if you could have gotten the information, they were like, no, let's try another one. And then the second bits were wrong. And so that's why they needed the spot on. Okay, uh, group number four, Bob four, spot on or not? I decided not. That's correct. Nobody <laughs> listened to you. Uh, group five, Bob five. Yes, that's my own. Yes, you're correct. Uh, and I think we had another group six, maybe? Yeah. yeah. Uh, group six, were you spied on or not? Yes. No, you were not. Uh, okay. Oh, okay. Michelle opened her internet leader in that. It was fine, but it wasn't fine. Uh -huh. <laughs> 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 okay, so uh, we got rid of seven, just six group, right? I think. Okay. Uh, well, that, that's a good example on like, it's much easier to discard the whole key if you have a doubt than uh, just using it. Regardless. Right. Right. Yeah. Okay. Super. Thanks for it. So here's the last slide. This is just to illustrate for you this in real, uh, a real experiment. Uh, uh, so uh, China has this amazing uh, Mesius uh, satellite in orbit about uh, four years ago, I think, 2018. And um, they have these uh, uh, telescopes, which uh, follow the satellite and the lasers, which send photons, individual <laughs> photons, up to the satellite, which uh, then sends them back down, in this case, to Vienna, to uh, uh, Anton Zeilinger's uh, lab in Vienna. Anton has uh, won the Nobel Prize this year for uh, work on uh, quantum entanglement, which is kind of the background behind this experiment. And uh, they were able to send, uh, it's a moving satellite, you know, it's a small target that you got to send photons up and hit the detector there and so forth. It's pretty complicated. And uh, they were able to send a few thousand 
secret bits, which were then used to encode uh, a, uh, a phone call between the president of uh, Anton, who was the president of the uh, Austrian Academy of Sciences, and the president of the uh, Chinese Academy of Sciences. And here's a little uh, animation. No, okay, there we go. So there's a satellite coming up over the horizon. Here's the laser beam from the telescope. You see the dome <laughs> turning as it goes. This is a kind of time lapse thing. That's why it's uh, uh, stretched out like that. Very technologically complex to send individual photons up to this thing that's moving 18,000 miles an hour. <laughs> Uh, and then have it uh, be able to send others down uh, from space to, uh, to Vienna. So this is the current state of the art in this technology. It's also been used in optical fiber. Uh, the, there's a, a company in Europe, ID Quantique, that uh, Nicolas Gisin founded that has done tests between banks in Switzerland sending encrypted bits through optical fiber over tens of kilometers. This is the light. The advantage of uh, using a satellite is you only have to go through a thin layer of the atmosphere. Right? The atmosphere is very, very thin. It's just a few miles of air. And then you go through vacuum. But the disadvantage is you got to hit that target and most of the photons go like this. So they have to do this many times. But, and then optical fiber is amazing. You can send light through it for several kilometers without much of it being absorbed. But if you want to send it across the Pacific, uh, you have to have amplifiers that can keep it going. And those amplifiers ruin the class of the quantum part and make it classical. So it's, you have to build something called a quantum repeater and we haven't, we're learning how to do that now. It's very, very hard. So it's still very early days for the technology, but these these this particular encoding, you know, is in actual use and, and actually works. So I hope you had fun and, and learned a few things. Thank you, Thank you so much. much.